this house was built in 1941 or 1942 and has been untreated since then. And you can see those new pieces of timber that we've put in at the bottom. I have full confidence that they will achieve the same colour as the house in time. There's another building, about 100 years old, that had quite a few uh, decades without paint. And as you can see, it doesn't go very deep, the weathering, some sp splitting and some colour discoloration, but fresh timber very close to the surface. So what I'm trying to do is show you a few examples of historical buildings that haven't been treated over a fairly known period of time, just to see how they look. So this building is from Telemark, Fiederstahl. Um, I'm not sure how old it is. It looks to me, it's got signs that it might be from the early 1700s, maybe even a little bit older than that. It certainly had a uh, tempera on the outside, the red colour. Um, but that interior section there has never been treated. So this building was, uh, has been untreated since 1875 and those two new pieces of timber which I put in, which actually were reclaimed, I mean they did have patina on them already. They've been in the house for two years. Again, in time, they'll go to this, exactly the same colour as the other wall. You won't be able to see the difference. It takes about 15 or 20 years. I'm also going to show some images from my farm where all of the houses are untreated at the present. And the only one that ever has been treated is that little woodshed that you can see in the middle of the picture now, which had compositionsmaling, we call it in Norway, which is a kind of tempera. It's a kind of... Um, paint that's made with rye flour and pigment water and it lasts about 30 or 40 years before it's completely washed away but there are some remnants we'll see later in the film so I'd like to look more deeply into this and also clear up some of the mistakes that I've made about the coloration of untreated wood I've been reading some scientific papers the last couple of weeks and uh, some of the information that I've received is either erroneous or I've misunderstood. And so I've been making some mistakes about that. I'd like to clear up and uh, we can look at a bit more detail at this subject in this film. Here we can see on this wall very clearly how the fibres have been removed by weather as a result of ultraviolet light weakening the glue that holds the fibres together the lignin. So once this uh, chemical has been weakened it kind of allows the fibres just to kind of fall off or be washed out by what rain. And some of the colours that are in the wood are leached out by the UV as well but also this uh, black fungus, swatsop black, black fungus it grows on the surface, making it look look as if it's been treated with tar, which it hasn't. So it's where the mistake uh, arises that people think these older untreated houses have been treated by tar. Um, the autumn wood is stiffer than the spring wood. And that accounts for the pitted, the increase in the pittedness of the surface because the autumn wood actually stands proud. And the knots, of course, take far less damage than the uh, vertical wood. So you can kind of see how many millimetres. Here it's about four millimetres of damage. And that's since 1932 on a south facing wall. On, we'll see on the uh, north facing wall there's hardly any of this kind of pitted damage. The fibres also crack and this is partly to do with it being heated from, by the sun and partly to do with the water going in and out because the water, the, this wall does get wet from time to time when it's windy. It doesn't get wet with ordinary vertical rainfall and it wouldn't have this brown colour if it were getting continuously wet because uh, 
it's a prerequisite that the wall is dry for it to get this uh, black and brown colour. So that's why one of the reasons why you get this very varied look from the top to bottom on a house like this. This piece of wood gets slightly more water on it because it's, although it's on the south wall, this piece is east facing and here the surface is grey. Now this is where the confusion lies because I've been led to believe in the past that this is also the same fungus that makes the black colour. But it, I've also been reading recently that this is uh, the colour of the cellulose after it's had the browner colours washed out of it. And you see it's just on the surface. Very, very thin, very, very thin layer. So I'm going to have to say that the that I'm I'm confused whether that what I've been told previously is correct or what I've been reading recently is correct, and that that's just the colour of the cellulose fibres without the uh, chemical colours that make the brown colour in wood. But anyway, you can see less less than a millimetre, far less than a millimetre, and we're back down to. Uh, wood coloured. The wood is deteriorating, we can see that, but what is the role of this wood? This board's been on this wall for 86 years. This is east facing, this is south facing. So those cracks go quite deep, but they're still, the point is this board is still doing its job. Now this is spruce, some woods crack much more than this, but uh, here, spruce, it's quite slow grown, but I see this particular board isn't massively slow grown. The damage goes about six, seven millimetres into the surface in the splits and then the actual weathered away parts of the board are uh, four or five millimetres in 80 years, 86 years. But the vital piece of information here is that it's still protecting the house underneath, which is the timber house, which doesn't ever get wet because of these boards. So with no treatment and no secondary maintenance of this wall, it's been doing its job for over 80 years, and there's still a lot of wear left in these boards before they stop doing that job. So you can think of this wall as being the sacrificial surface. In the same way that a painted surface is sacrificial when the paint gets worn off. But uh, personally I like the way it weathers. I think it looks great. And I like the fact that the surface is variegated with different colours from this dark black mould that grows on the surface to the browns which are the colour the colour of chemicals being leached out of the surface by the heat and the grey. Now, whether that's just the cellulose fibre or actually the same kind of mould that's the black, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, wait for more conclusive evidence from, from the scientists. Because it's not clear. But, I mean, what is clear is that it does its job for a long time with minimal effort. And then the discoloration here, as I've said in many of my films before, is from a microorganism. Quinone methides are directly involved in the process of lignification, which is what gives the wood cells their strength. Conversely, with sunlight, their changed nature leads to the failure of the lignin and, importantly for this film, the change in colour of the untreated wood. So what we're seeing is a combination of this uh, microorganism and the uh, natural colour of the cellulose fibre of the wood after it's had its colour washed out of it. Um, these were done in the 60s, these boards, because the windows were changed in the 60s, late 60s. Um, so we can, again, it's the same, same kind of criteria that the amount of damage done here is about four or five millimetres of damage in 60 years. 
these ones were from 1932, these ones were from 1960. 30 years more damage on these ones from the sun. The west wall takes the most damage because that's when the sun is at a lower angle, beating straight at 90 degrees onto the wood. So after UV light has destroyed this lignin, the glue, it allows the fibres to be removed by rain, allowing that surface to be pitted. This oak gate shows the same process happening. So it's not just softwoods, it also happens on hardwoods. Just takes a little bit longer because they're more dense. Right, this is the north facing wall. And we're quite a lot higher off the ground here, almost a metre off the ground. There's a little bit of surface um, fungus growing there. And I think that's also the kind of lichen that grows on stones. Uh, but there's no discernible rot in that uh, vombret, the waterboard. Now here we can actually see almost the full dimension of the timber because it has had really none of that sun damage because here the sun doesn't actually beat very much on this wall. At Midsummer's Eve, the sun goes down in the north-northwest and comes up in the north-northeast about two or three in the morning. Uh, so it does get a little bit of sun, but really very little and not enough for this yeah. microorganism to turn black. It stays fairly grey. and. A little bit of water keeps it in that light grey colour. So this is the mistake that uh, the light grey colour is also a microorganism. I think it's rather more a chemical state or the cellulose fibre without colour. But what is curious is that this only happens outdoors. It doesn't get this colour indoors. So I think that perhaps there is some, uh, some disagreement. There must be some reason why I've been told in the past that that is a microorganism. But it could also just be a misinterpretation of these different chemical names and whether or not they're living organisms or not. I mean, they behave like living organisms. They're kind of on the boundaries. <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say was, is that here, these pieces of timber uh, haven't had that... Um, they haven't been weathered as much, nearly as much. So you can kind of see the structure of the old pieces of wood. Now, all of the pieces of wood on this house had this structure before. So uh, that way we can measure really accurately the amount of damage that's happened in the time. That's... So we can start to develop rules of thumb about the rate of damage. Yeah, good. Hardly any damage on this wall at all. I mean, this literally is going to be good for a couple of hundred years, that, that wall. Probably a couple of hundred years more than it is now. And let's just swing around a little bit. These are the ones that were done in the 1960s, late 1960s. Uh, so it gives a really clear comparison. I've said it many times before, but around about 100 years ago, in this area of Norway, very, very few houses were painted. You see all of the old photographs from 1900, and you see that really houses were not, not treated. Now, I think this is the oldest panelling on the farm and I think that this building was built uh, before 1900, maybe in 1900, maybe 1912. There was a building uh, stage that happened in 1912 here but that's the barn and I think that this existed before the barn. I think they started with this very small building and some of my reasoning for that is to do with the way the roof was made. Now this house was covered with the composition paint that was used on that last project that I did for series of the railway in Men's Cottage and it's made from uh, rye flour and pigment mixed together, an ochre, red ochre, and that lasts, maybe it lasted 40 or 50 years, there are still some traces of it and it stops the sunlight from coming to the fibres and so it uh, stops the damage to the fibres that I've been pointing out on these western walls. So up there in the uh, Tarkwood stick, what's that called in English, in that bit where the roof sticks out. It's very well protected, so you can see the traces of the red paint left there. Well, there's a nice pleasant cool breeze now, which probably is going to make noise in the microphone, so I apologise for that. 
Now this barn was built in 1912, but what's interesting to see here is how things that I've done recently, in the last, well, at least 15 years ago, you can see what happens to new wood. So this was completely fresh, untreated wood. Actually the hinges did have galvanised, uh, they were galvanised, I actually took the galvanisation off. But you can see they take on the same colour as the surrounding walls. Not exactly the same, but those windows are sometimes open and get wet, so they are going to be lighter anyway. If you look at the old door, you can see exactly where the water, when that door is open, you can see exactly where the water has dripped down, changing the colour of the microorganism from black to grey. That's that board. That's that grey stripe. I built this bridge here two years ago so that I could get up into the barn with the car and use it as an inspection bridge and you can see all of that timber which has constant wetting goes grey. So it's only the driest wood that goes black like that and as I've said in that, that um, that's the cow shed that was built in 1948. So let's go and do some close-ups of these. Those shutters were made in 2002. This barn wall is from 1912. It's south facing. And this door, that, that wall is from 1948. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is all of these different walls with their different ages, none of which have been treated with linseed oil paint or with tar or any of those modern alkyd oil paints. The one building having just been done with a colour treatment with rye flour and pigment. And this gives you a very good idea of the different levels of patina and deterioration of an untreated wooden wall. Now, admittedly, these most of these timbers are these wall, um, most of these boards are very tightly grown, slow-grown spruce, and. The modern spruce isn't the same, doesn't have the same quality really. Um, so I, I can't say for sure that, the, that they would last as long as these have lasted. But not every board has that very high quality. Some of these boards are loosely grown and I don't see any boards that really have suffered from being untreated. And they're there to protect what's inside them. In this case there's a timber house and in this case it was a hay barn but I actually have insulated a couple of rooms in here so they're protecting that paper insulation. So I'm uh, heralding a new period where especially in Norway people can start leaving their houses untreated. I'm going to show some pictures of some customers houses which have uh, been untreated as well. Them. All of these examples are taken from this inland area of Norway where I live and I've been following the traditional vernacular and copying decisions that have been made by people in previous generations and the same is good advice for anybody, follow your local traditions. So this house that was built in 1875 has this new extension on one corner here, which is 
This is the weathering after 20 months. That's the east wall and then moving around to the south wall. Which is starting to get slightly grey. No, it points down towards the lake, so it could be slightly higher humidity in the air from that direction. This little bit of fencing was done at the same time. I think that was actually done last summer, so that's had about 12 or 14 months. So you can kind of see a line there where the colour is concentrated above the grey. This house was built at the end of the 14th century and those are some repairs that I did a few years ago. So that's oak. From It's had about six years of weathering there. This house from Telemark is probably 600 years old. But that has had some treatment. You can see there's kind of vestiges of tar on that one. And this building was just photographed. These pictures are from after, well, I mean, just a few days after the panels were put on. I just want to finish up with making a comparison with these walls, which were treated with iron sulphate and the naturally treated boards we've been looking at. This is often given as an alternative to leaving the boards untreated, but as you see, it doesn't give the varied surface and the different colours and patterns you get from natural weathering. So I don't usually recommend it. I don't find a homogeneous surface like this more attractive than this uh, the varied surface you get from natural weathering. So there we go. That's my little film about untreated boards. Thanks very much for watching and welcome back to see more later. Bye.